All right, uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let me turn the lights a little bit. Um, I don't know if you all have had a chance to go on to MU Online, but if you, uh, if you do, I've posted a link on MU Online that will link to the playlist on YouTube for this class. So all of the lectures will end up being deposited onto that playlist. So instead of putting a link for every single video, I just put a link to the one playlist. So everything will ultimately get there. So I'll do a lecture, and then it takes a little while to process and upload to YouTube, and then I go and change the description a little bit and then throw it on the playlist. So probably sometime tomorrow it'll be on there. And that, that'll probably be the pattern for the rest of the semester, something about like that. Sound good? <coughs> all right. I'll do my best to keep the uh, playlist and whatnot up to date so that they're all there. All right. Everybody good? Okay. All right. So last time what we did is we talked a little bit about um, uh, just what finite element analysis is. But really, I wanted to sort of get through some of the nuts and bolts associated with how Excel works and ultimately matrix math. Okay, because it is a very, very big component of this class. Um, and ultimately, I am, this is not a linear algebra course, okay? I am not expecting you all to be deriving vector spaces and anything like that. This is all about application of linear algebra, how to multiply matrices, how to do transposes, how to do inverses, and ultimately how to do them with some of the computational tools at your disposal, particularly Microsoft Excel. And I think you'll see after today why I, I, I like something like Excel for this class, because the finite element method is a very visual process, especially uh, when it comes to assembly. Now, what I'm going to do today and, and for the next uh, couple weeks is show you matrix stiffness analysis. Now, the matrix stiffness analysis and finite element analysis are, are largely the, the same thing. The, the main difference is how you come up with this. So if you recall from last time, uh, we looked at a very basic example. For instance, we looked at a bar. That bar has some cross-sectional area, some modulus of elasticity E, some length L. You apply a load, you can get the deflection as PL over AE. And we uh, identified this term stiffness. Okay? For an axial bar, the axial stiffness value is AE over L. Now, in this course, we're not, uh, we don't care so much about stiffness values as we do stiffness matrices, because that's really what we're doing is, is looking at uh, stiffness matrices. That, that's what we're uh, essentially after. We take a very complex structure or system, break it down into simple components, components simple enough such that we can write a stiffness matrix for each of those components, and then assemble it into one big system uh, matrix. So. Um, uh, you probably noticed in that sentence I said the word matrix about seven times. Should emphasize how much matrix algebra uh, means to us in this course. Um, but I think after today you'll kind of get a bigger picture understanding of how things work. Um, now before we start delving into finite element analysis or matrix stiffness analysis or anything like this, um, I want to uh, say a little bit right off the bat in regards to our sign convention. Now, one of the things about finite element analysis is that when you employ it, you kind of have to maintain a consistent sign convention. Otherwise, things get kind of messy and things get, get kind of confusing. So we're going to adopt this right off the bat. Okay? So number one, any time that we're dealing with a force or displacement in the x direction, we're going to consider things to the right positive, to the left negative. Okay? That's, we're just going to keep that right off the bat. For the vertical direction or the y-axis, anything upward is positive. That goes for forces and displacement. So if you think, if I have, let's say, a, a simply supported beam and a uniformly distributed load on the top acting downward, all of its resulting displacements would be negative. It's deflecting downward. Okay, make sense? Now that's translation in the x direction, translation in the y direction. For rotation, we're going to consider counterclockwise. Um, rotations to be considered or moments to be considered positive. Now that's for two di dimensions, for three dimensions it's going to be little more than uh, utilizing consistent vector notation and right hand rule and things like that, but ultimately that's where all this is coming from. Okay, everybody good? All right, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the difference between 2D analysis and 3D analysis later because we'll look at three dimensional stress analysis uh, later on. Everybody good? Okay. All right, now what I'm uh, 
going to do today is I'm going to focus my lecture around this example. Okay? Now, now, to be perfectly honest, if you've taken a course in mechanics and materials, you actually probably did a problem like this in undergrad, but you certainly didn't do it using some sort of matrix methodology, which is what we're going to do today. So let me kind of explain what's going on with this example. So I have a system that is comprised of three separate bars. Now each of these bars, in the, uh, uh, indicated by these boxes, there's a one, two, and three, three bars. Each of these bars has different material properties, cross-sectional areas, lengths, they're all a little different, okay? So um, from, a, uh, from a terminology standpoint, in this course, we would say that this structure is comprised of three elements. Okay? There are three elements. Those three bars we consider to be elements in this class, three individual elements. Okay? <coughs> now these points one, two, three, and four, we call those nodes. Now I, I, I'll be honest, I sometimes use the word joint and, and the word node interchangeably, at least now. Like when we get later on and we start doing virtual work and, and isoparametric elements and things like that, I'll probably exclusively use the word node. Okay? But uh, if I ever use the word joint and node interchangeably, they kind of mean the same thing. If I ever use the words member and element interchangeably, they mean the same thing. Okay? So this structure would be comprised of four nodes and three elements. Okay? So if we remember way back when to, to the earlier part of the last lecture, and I showed that big truss, each one of those joints on the truss would have been a node, and each one of those members would represent an element. Okay. So far, so good? Okay. Now, um, one other thing that, that you kind of have to think about a, a little differently when you look at uh, matrix analysis problems is you need to start thinking in terms of degrees of freedom. Now, what I mean by that is this. Let's go back to a simple statics problem. Let's go back to that example before, the simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load. And you want to do some analysis on that. Usually the first thing that you think about is, okay, here's this simply supported beam. How many unknown reactions do I have, right? Then based on those unknown reactions, it's time to apply something like sum of forces or sum of moments, right? So right off the bat, what you're thinking about is in terms of unknown forces. How many unknown forces will define what this structure is going to look like? That's, I want you to think a little differently now. Now what I want you to think about is unknown displacements. Okay? I want you to think about how many displacements will define the, the displaced shape for this structure. Now, now for this example, what I'm doing is I'm only considering displacements along the x direction. I'm not considering displacements along the y direction or any types of rotations. I'm only look at dis looking at displacements this way. So for this structure, ultimately I'm going to say there's a total possible four displacements that define this structure. Now two of them we know. We know the displacement at joint one or node one, and we know the displacement at joint four or node four. What are the displacements at one and four? Zero. They are fixed. Node one and node four aren't moving. That's actually what defines the boundary conditions for this problem. Okay? So we will use those boundary conditions later, and you'll see there's a very particular way we do use them. Okay? <coughs> Everybody good? All right. Okay. So. For this structure, let's just sort of make sure we understand what's going on. For this structure, each of these individual elements or members has two degrees of freedom. If I look at any one bar, I have a degree of freedom over here and a degree of freedom over here. Okay? I'm only saying there's one degree of freedom on each node because I'm only considering displacements in this direction along the x-axis. The difference between this type of element, which I'm going to call a bar element, the difference between a bar element and a truss element, in trusses we consider two displacements at each joint, one in the x direction and one in the, in the y direction, because trusses are planar structures. They are defined by their x coordinates and their y coordinates, and that's what makes the difference between a bar element and a truss element. The mechanics are actually the same. It's all a function of coordinate systems uh, and things like that. Okay, everybody good? All right, so each joint has one degree of freedom, so each member 
has two degrees of freedom. The whole system as a whole, though, has four degrees of freedom. Everybody good? Okay. Now, like I said, what we are going to do ultimately is define what we call a stiffness matrix. Okay? <laughs> All right? So let me sort of explain what a stiffness matrix is. And I might actually break away from the slideshow for a little bit to do some scribbling on the board because I want to ultimately explain really well what's in the slides to follow. And if I've got to take some time to do that, I really do because this is an important concept. Okay? So a stiffness matrix essentially is meant to describe the relationship between applied forces and resulting displacements. That's what it's meant to describe. Okay? So if I go back a couple of slides, just to kind of emphasize that, this is our, our fundamental expression, that stiffness times displacement equals the force. So that stiffness, it's essentially a series of constants that describe the relationship between forces and displacements. Now, what we do from an analysis standpoint, or from, from a definition standpoint, I should say, to define the stiffness matrix, what we say is this. We say that stiffness, those values in that matrix, the, the, like the K11, the K22, the K whatever, okay, those are the forces that result from a unit displacement, a displacement of one. So, so the idea is if I have this matrix, which is full of the forces that result from a displacement of one, and then I multiply that times the actual displacements, I get the actual forces. Does, does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? It's like, well, here's the force if the displacement is one, so if the displacement is two, it'd be that times two and give you the actual force. Everybody okay with that? Okay, all right. Uh, let me go. Okay, so for an individual term in the matrix, okay, Kij, it equals the force at I generated by a unit deflection at J. Okay? So what I want to do is I want to take a little bit of time and explain this. Okay? Now if I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go off of the slideshow a little bit and do some scratching on, uh, on a smart board. Ultimately though, what I am scratching out is the same thing that's in your slides. I may be doing it in a little bit of a different order. But I've done this a few times, and I think this is the easiest way to explain it. Okay, so, give me a moment. All right, so let's have a little fun with this and make sure we understand what's going on. Okay, so let's start off with just the mechanics. Can you all read that? Is that a little small? You want me to write a little bigger? Is that good? All right. Okay, so let's just go back to the fundamental mechanics. Okay, so here's a bar. Oops. Here's that. And I'm applying some load P to that bar, right? Okay, now let's also define some characteristics of that bar, okay? That bar has some length L, right? And then there are also characteristics associated with the bar itself, things like a cross-sectional area A, and then some material property like a modulus of elasticity E. Everybody okay with that? Now, what mechanics says is that the deflection is PL over A E. So far so good? Now. Everybody okay with that? Now, what I have done is I've said, all right, let's look at it like this. Let's try and determine what a stiffness value is. And I said, well, in order to define a stiffness value, I'm going to say it is the force resulting from a unit displacement. Okay? Unit displacement. So what I'm going to do for this unit displacement is just that. This displacement, I'm going to set equal to one, I'm going to say unit displacement, right? So that means that I've got one is PL over AE. And then I'm, determine, I'm trying to determine what is that resulting force. Well, in this model, the force is P, right? I solve this equation, and I get that, therefore, P 
P is A over L, right? Everybody okay with that? So I have a name for this term, this AE over L. I'm saying that this is what we call axial stiffness. That's axial stiffness, AE over L. Everybody okay with this? Okay. If everybody's all right with this, now let's look at this from a matrix standpoint, okay? If you need me to leave this up here for a little bit, I'm, I'm more than fine to do that. Is everybody good? I'll give it a couple minutes. That's fine. If y'all need to write this down. Okay, you're right. I'll give you a moment. Oh, goodness. Shut this door. I am definitely going to bump into that before the night's out. Oh, look at this key. Stiff axial. <laughs> this is the inverse of stiffness. This is flexibility. <laughs> that key is messed up. That was before I got here. All right, there we go. Everybody good? Okay. Now. Let me go back to make sure uh, we recognize that definition for stiffness. Now, what was that term KIJ? It said the force at I generated by some unit displacement at J, right? Okay, all right. So let's look at the matrix approach, and let's see what's going on with that. Okay. Okay. So we've looked at the mechanics. Now I want to look at, I, I'll make up a name, I'll call it the element perspective. Okay, so what does a bar element look like? A bar element looks something about like this. Okay. Um, let's see, what do we got? We've got a length L and then for the sake of discussion this will make sense I'm gonna draw some sort of dash lines going down about like that okay it has some area some modulus of elasticity now another point that's really worth making is this bar element is defined by joints or nodes right there is node 1 right here and node 2 right there. You can call them 1 and 2, A and B, whatever. Okay, this isn't a particular element. This is just any bar element. There's a node on the left and a node on the right. Everybody okay? Now, okay, let's go back to this definition, okay? Definition says, okay, for uh, a stiffness value, it is the deflection at I due to a unit deflection at J. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that there are two possible cases. Okay, case one is that the deflection at the first node equals one. Case two is that deflection at the second node equals one. Is everybody okay with that? Okay, so watch this. Okay, so let's, let's drag this down a little bit and we're going to say case one. Okay, case one. Case one, we're going to say the deflection at the first node is one. Deflection at the second node is zero. Okay, now what does that look like? Okay, first off, the second node. The deflection's zero, right? So it's going to be right there, right? It doesn't move, right? Now, for the, the first node, though, deflection is one. So it moves. Now let's see if you've been paying attention. Node one, if the deflection is one, does it move to the left or to the right? To the right. Why does it move to the right? It's positive, right? So would you agree with me that case one, the element looks something about like this? 
Would that be what it looks like? Where this dimension is 1.0. Is that a fair statement? That's what case one says. The deflection or the element before and after looks like this. Now you all know enough about mechanics to be able to answer this question. If I have if this is like my before and after, the upper image is the before and after the element looks like this. In order to get that element to look like that, is that element in compression or in tension? Compression, okay? So by that logic, would you agree that the resulting forces better look like that? Is that a fair statement? Okay, now, here's another question. The deflection is 1, so what is the magnitude of those forces? AE over L, right? That's what we just said, that under a unit displacement, the force is AE over L. We just said that, right? So this one's AE over L. Does everybody understand that? Everybody good? Okay, now, here's where the, the kicker comes in. This is where you really ought to pay attention, okay? Now, let's go back to the stiffness definition. Kij, the force at I due to a unit displacement at J. So I propose to you that in terms of naming, in terms of naming, this is K11. Think about it. It is the force at one, we're looking at the force at this left node, due to a unit displacement at one. Does, does everybody see that? Okay, now, if that's the case, what is the name of the one on the right? K21, there we go. Is everybody okay with that? Now, let's write some formulas here on the left. K11 and K 2, 1. If I wanted to mathematically write K11, well, let's see, what direction is K11 acting? To the, pause, there we go, positive, to the right. So this is positive AE. This bottom one? Negative. Does everybody see that? Negative AE over L. There we go. I can write that E a little better. Does everybody understand that? That's a very important observation to make. Okay, everybody good? So, let's do the flip side, okay? Flip side, let's drag this down. Okay, and now we're going to look at case two. And case two says the opposite, that D1 is 0 and D2 is 1.0. So if I drag this down a little bit, what does that look like? Well, node 1 doesn't, go, doesn't do anything at all, but node 2 is 1. It goes to the right, doesn't it? So would you agree that that's going to look something Something about like that, right? Where this dimension is now the 1.0. So now, from a before and after standpoint, earlier I had placed that element in compression. Does that hold true for this case? No. What? It's in tension, right? So in order to get this element to look like that, I must apply forces that are tensile, right? That's number one. Now let's do some naming. What's the name for this force on the left? K12. There we go. It is the force at one due to a displacement at two. Everybody all right with that? So this is K12. This one on the left, or on the right, is K22. So, what do we have? K12 is 
What's the formula? There we go. Minus AE over L. And K22, positive AE over L. How are we feeling? It's not too bad, is it? That, that's, that should be fairly straightforward, right? Okay, I'm going to leave this up here for a second, make sure you all have a chance to write this down. And then we're going to go back to the slideshow, and you'll kind of see what's going on in the slideshow. Ah, okay, now I get it. <laughs> now, while you're writing this down, one point I'll make, this is for an element that has two degrees of freedom. Let's say the element had four degrees of freedom. Well, you would have four cases. D1 is 1, the rest are 0. D2 is 1, the rest are 0. D3, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Everybody got this? I see, I still see a couple of people right now. Give me a moment. So far, so good? All right, okay. Let's get out of this and let's go to, let's go back here. Okay, so KIJ, force generated at I due to a unit displacement at J. Now, one thing that should point out or, or pop out is that's, those are matrix terms. That's a matrix definition. So, really, what we should get is a stiffness matrix. Now, we've already illustrated this by looking at this problem. But if a bar has two degrees of freedom, it stands to reason that its stiffness matrix is two by two, right? Well, that's what we got. That, that, that's what we were seeing here in these stiffness terms, right? A two by two system, okay? All right. <laughs> now, an easy way of getting those terms is to look at these cases. Case one, the first value is one. Case two, the second value is one. Now, you do all the matrix math, and then all this slide is doing is demonstrating what I was saying before. What is stiffness? It is a force at I due to a unit displacement at J. When you substitute ones and zeros in for your displacements, what do you get? You get that stiffness values equal forces. And another thing, look at this. Look at case one. You do the math, and what do you yield? K11 and K21. Those are the stiffness. That's what we were looking at. For case two, K12, K22. Right? That's what we got. So far, so good? All right. You can do the same process for elements that are really simple or really complicated. That's the general gist of what we do. Okay. <clears throat> now, again, the mechanics. Mechanics say that the stiffness or the force resulting is AE over L. So we adopt that similar philosophy looking at case one displacement, uh, positive displacement, yielding a membrane compression. Case two, same thing, only you get the membrane tension. All in all, that's going to be your stiffness matrix. Now, what have I done from this upper definition to the bottom definition? Well, AE over L is a common constant. Factor it out. So 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1. Everybody see that? Now, let's go back to some of them matrix uh, definitions. Can I, all right. Okay, you, you're right on there. What, what were you going to say? Continue that thought. Well, it, if we transpose it, we get the same thing. So it is symmetric. That is a symmetric matrix. Does, there, does everybody see that? Individual elemental stiffness matrices are always symmetric. What about the values along the main diagonal? What are they? They're, they're one, but they're not just one. They're, they're positive. Stiffness matrices will always have positives along the main diagonal, at least in linear elastic analysis. Everybody good? OK. Now. The, the, the nice thing, there's a couple nice things worth mentioning about that stiffness matrix. That stiffness matrix for that one bar is the same stiffness matrix for any bar in any problem. That is really nice for something like this, okay? Because this only has to remember one stiffness matrix for one bar, and now it can do any problem. Make sense? Now, what we just did just now was what I'm calling a direct approach. Okay? Direct approach meaning I am taking the bar. 
I am yanking on it and I am getting the results, or taking that bar, pushing on it, and getting the results. That's a direct approach, okay? I'm going to show you later an approximate approach that we call finite elements, okay? Now, the nice thing about finite elements is that for simple cases like this, you get the same answer. But finite elements will give you answers for much more complex elements as well, and that's its advantage. But we'll get to that later. Right now, I just want you to understand how matrix analysis works. Everybody good so far? Back to our problem. Okay. Again, the stiffness matrix that we defined for A bar is the same stiffness matrix for any bar anywhere. Okay. So what I've got is, well, let's look at element number one. Its cross-sectional area is six square inches. Its E value is 2,000 KSI, and its length is 120 inches. So AE over L, in this case, is 100. So here's its stiffness matrix, just a bunch of 100s, plus and minus. For stiffness made for element number two, 8, 3,000, and 120, there's its stiffness matrix. And then I've got the stiffness matrix for this element as well. So, so, so far, so good? Now, this brings up a really good point that I should mention right now. And uh, if you've got pens, you might want to write this down or just put a star somewhere. Um, now, the civil engineers in the room probably see something on this that, that's a little strange. For instance, when, when civil engineers deal with, with structural analysis, and this is going to be true for you mechanicals as well, but I'm using this as an example. Let's say a civil engineer is doing a truss analysis. So civil engineers are going to see KSIs for material values. They're going to see square inches for member properties. But what do we express member lengths in, in civil engineering? Do we say a member is 650 inches long? What do we say? It's however many feet long, right? That's what's natural. That's what makes sense. Now, if you're thinking SI, yeah, you might have uh, so many square millimeters or square centimeters for a, a cross-sectional area, but the member is four meters long, okay? One of the things about finite element analysis is that, is that, in general, it is blind to units. In other words, you, as the analyst, better make sure that your units are consistent. Now, what do I mean by that? Look at this problem. Area, six square inches. E, kips per square inch. Member length, 120 inches. Okay? See how the units are consistent? If I, throw, if I made this 10 feet and I put 10 there, I mean, am I, am I theoretically going to get the same answer? Yeah, but the units are going to be all messed up, okay? So that, that's a big deal, making sure that your units are consistent. In general, if you look at, at finite element programs like, like Abacus or FEMAP, like we are, are going to look at later, and you ask, well, Dr. Michelson, what are the units that Abacus uses or FEMAP uses? I'll tell you simple. It doesn't use any units. It is your job as the analyst to keep that straight. Now, there, there are positives and negatives to that. The negative is that you have to remember. The positive is, though, is that you can run a model in whatever unit system you're comfortable with. Okay? If you're comfortable with moments of inertia in millimeters to the fourth as opposed to centimeters and fourth, well, then you get to use that as long as your model is 10,000 millimeters long or, and your uh, uh, other associated properties are reflective of that as well. As long as your units are consistent, you can do whatever you want. Everybody all right with that? So it's a point I would make right now. <laughs> all right. So back on point. Is everybody okay with where we're at so far? Okay. Now, so so far we have developed what's called a stiffness matrix for each individual element. Okay. That's nice, but that really didn't help us when we're trying to analyze the problem. What we need is a stiffness matrix for the whole thing. Okay. Now, we don't just add them up. We use a special process known as assembly. We don't add them up, we assemble them, okay? Like the Avengers, assemble. Uh, okay, some people, all right, we got jokes, okay, good. All right, so we will Avengers this problem tonight. Okay, so um, I say add, but it's a very special process, and I think you'll see how this works. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, L let's go back to uh, the original thing I said earlier. Uh, in regards to degrees of freedom. If you remember when we were looking at these individual elements, each element has 
two degrees of freedom, but the whole system has four, right? Well, let, let's think about this mathematically. If a two degree of freedom element resulted in a two by two stiffness matrix, it would stand to reason that if the whole system has four degrees of freedom, well then the whole stiffness matrix is going to be four by four. Does that make sense? Okay, well that, that's what we got. We have a stiffness matrix for this whole system that's going to be four by four. So for the whole system, what we need to define is this relationship. We need the big stiffness matrix. Okay? Now, how are we going to do that? We're going to assemble it. Okay? Now, how is this going to work? Okay? I want to take some time and pay attention to what's going on in this slide, particularly looking at these little codes that I've put on the, LM, or on the stiffness matrices. Let's take this first one, K1. So the math told us that the stiffness values were going to be 100, minus 100, so on and so forth. But notice how i got these little numbers here, this 1, 2, and 1, 2. Do you see where that's coming from? This first element is connected to this node and that node, 1 and 2. Now let's take K3. Same numbers, but no, 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 3 and 4, right? So it's connected to this one and connected to that one. Y'all see that? Okay. <coughs> All right, so far so good? So here's how assembly works. What I do is I start off with a blank empty system. And then I start inserting those stiffness values where they go in the respective system matrix. So for the first matrix, one, two, one, two, okay? So that stiffness matrix is going to populate that set of cells, okay? Now, we got a little bit of a, a hiccup though coming up because now if we look at this matrix, does everybody see the problem? We're going we're gonna to overlap. And what do you do at that overlap? You add them up. Okay? Now if you think about it, that kind of that makes sense from a mechanics standpoint as well. Because at that joint, I don't have one element, I have two. So think about what that stiffness term represents. I have to take that joint move it through a unit displacement. So in reality, if I'm looking at the whole system, in order to actually take my hand, grab that joint, and move it, I have to overcome the stiffness of both of those elements, right? I've got to yank on both of them. So because of that, at that particular point, I've got to add them up. Same thing for the next element. We've got to add those values there as well. Okay? So what do you think populates the rest of those terms in the, in the stiffness matrix? Zeros. Because, think about it, if I grab joint one, lock all the others, and move joint one, how does that affect joint four? It doesn't. That's why we get a zero there. Okay? <laughs> so, we took those individual elements and we assembled them. This is assembly. That's how assembly works. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, <laughs> that is assembly for our stiffness matrix. So we now have a stiffness matrix for the whole system. Here's the load vector for the whole system. Remember, what's our relationship? It's force equals stiffness times displacement. The forces, that's a simple load vector to define. Okay? What do I have? I have R1, 300, negative 125, R4. How did I get that? Well, to start off, the R1 and the R4, those are the support reactions. I don't have a clue what those are because I haven't done any analysis yet, right? Now the 300 and the 125, why do I have 300? Because it's moving to the right. Why do I have negative 125? Because it's moving to the left. See consistent sign convention? See how that's coming into play? Now, the way that finite elements works and the way that matrix analysis works, this whole time I told you to think about problems in terms of unknown displacements. So that's what we're going to solve for is the unknown displacements. Now before we can do that though, we have to apply boundary conditions. Okay? So would you agree that so far this is what our system relationship looks like? Okay? Everybody okay with that? Now, remember for this problem joint one and joint four are fixed. Everybody good? Now, this is what the matrix looks like and I'm just going to tell you how we apply boundary conditions and then I'm going to explain why. That's how we're going to apply boundary conditions. We are going to strike out the rows and columns associated with one and four. 
Why the first row and the fourth row? Why the first column and the fourth column? Because those are the ones that are fixed. Now, if you go, well, how in the heck are you coming up with just striking out the rows and columns? Bear with me. We'll see how this works. Okay. First off, let's, let's go back to the original problem, and let's, let's sort of delve into why that works. Okay. First off, remember what this represents. Remember, this is just a fancy way of writing that whole four equations and four unknowns, right? So would you agree if I took this and multiplied it out? Remember matrix multiplication. Let's take this first row. What do I have? That times that plus that times that plus that times that plus that times that equals that, right? That's what matrices represent is just this. Everybody okay with that? Now I want to take some time and really pay attention to what's going on on those uh, bottom sets of equations. I want to look at this. Okay, first off, wouldn't it be fair to just cross out all of these terms and all of these terms? How, how am I doing that? Well, what is D1? D1 is zero. It is the displacement at one and one is fixed. It's zero. What is D4? It's zero. Everybody okay with that? So that one's simple. The other one requires a little bit of observation. Okay? A little bit of observation. Okay? If I look at these two middle equations, how many are there? There are two equations. How many unknowns? Two unknowns, right? So these two central equations are really all that's needed to actually solve for the displacements. Two equations, two unknowns. I can then take those displacements and then plug them back in to the top and bottom equation to get the reactions. Does that make sense? So my point is, right now, I just don't need the top equation and the bottom equation. So we struck out the columns because they were associated with D1 and D4. We struck out the rows because we just don't need them right now. Everybody good? So that's how we strike out the rows. And now we're left with this smaller reduced system. This reduced system accounting only for or accounting for the boundary conditions applied. Two equations, two unknowns, that's easy to solve. And by now, if all I did was give you a homework assignment and say, here's this problem, give me that. How do you do that? In Excel, you take the inverse of this matrix and do matrix multiplication of that and this, right? Isn't that how matrix algebra works? If you have AX equals B, then X is the inverse of A times B, right? That's a fundamental matrix analysis problem. All right, everybody good? Does anybody have any questions before we move on? This is important stuff. Yes, sir? Well, okay, all right. Keep in mind, uh, let, me, let me go back a little bit. Remember, going, going back to this, if you've got this system, you can write it in matrix format. And then if I look at this, if I look at AX equals B, well, in order to isolate X, I have to multiply both sides by A inverse. Because on the left, A inverse times A is going to give you the identity matrix. And the identity matrix times X is going to give you X. So on the left, we get A inverse times B. Is that, then that, that, don't be, I mean, please, ask any questions you want. This is good stuff. Everybody good? Okay. Let's see, where was I? Okay. Is everybody comfortable with doing this on your own? If not, no worries. We are going to do this example start to finish in Excel next time. Everybody good? Okay. All right. So we now have the displacements on the unknown joints, right? So we now have the displacement for the whole structure because there's four joints, right? D1 and D4 are zero, and D2 and D3 are that. So what direction are they displacing? Oh, those displacements are positive, which means they are displacing to the right. There we go. They're going to the right. Make sense? Okay. So now I've got the displacements at each joint. Now let's think about this problem as if this were, were a full out problem. What do I really care about in a problem like this? Well, I care about the support reactions, right? Care about the support reactions. 
I care about the displacements. Don't I want the force in each member? Wouldn't that be nice to know? Well, how do I get the force in each member? Well, couldn't I determine the displacement of each member? If I've got the displacement on each member, and it's funny how I've already got the stiffness matrix on each member, then stiffness times displacement is going to give me the, the force. There we go. So this is the displacement for the whole structure. Would you agree that I could write a displacement vector for number one, displacement for element number two, displacement for element three? Would you agree with that? Now, do you see how I come up with that? Okay, so these are the displacements for the whole structure, right? The first one and the last one are zero, and the middle ones are the one that we solved for. So element number one is one and two, then two and three, three and four, right? Then I go back in my calculations, I say, well, I've got K1, K2, K3, right? I now have D1, D2, D3, right? So it's funny how you just multiply them and you get F1, F2, F3, right? Now, there's some really interesting result when you look at this force vector, or these series of force vectors. Look at each one of them. Now, I want you to look at these two terms. Now, one thing to notice, the magnitudes are the same, right? They're both 130, right? They are equal and opposite, though. One's negative, one's positive. And that trend is true, watch, for all of them. Negative, positive, positive, negative, positive, negative. But the magnitude is the same. It's just a sign difference, right? That better be true on problems like this anytime you do it. Otherwise, you did something wrong. And I'll explain why. What does this force vector represent? It represents the forces at the end of that member, right? So here's my element, right? What does, let, let, let's, let's think about this from a math standpoint and see if you can tell me what's going on with element number one. Element number one, that first force, is it going to the left or to the right? To the left, right? It's negative, right? So that's going that way, right? 130, positive 130, is that going to the left or to the right? Right. So are you telling me that on an element number one, the forces are going like that? Is that what you're telling me? So by that very nature, must they be equal in magnitude? Yeah, you can't have 130 and then 120, otherwise the bar's running away from you, right? And the fact that it's negative positive tells you that the element is in tension. So what's going on with element number two? Compression. There we go. Now we're picking it up. So if I look at free body diagrams for each of these elements, that's what this means, right? So far, so good? Now, here's where things get kind of cool, all right? Let's take these results and superimpose them. Watch this. Okay, superimpose them. Okay, so here's element number one, element number two, element number three, right? 130 in tension, 170 in compression, 45 in compression. Is everybody okay with that? Watch this. I want you to look at joint two, which is right here. Does everybody see that? Now, what do we have at joint two on this upper row of diagrams? We've got 130 to the right, 170 to the right. So if I have 130 to the right and 170 to the right, what do I get? 300 to the right. What was the original load at joint two? See that? What about here? 170 to the left, 45 to the right. What does that net? 125 to the left. What was the original load? 125. So summing these up, we get the original forces. So take a wild stab. What are these? These forces right here. Those are the support reactions, right? I want you to take a little bit of time and digest what's on this slide. Think about it. Okay, we now have the support reactions for the entire structure. We now have the member forces inside every member in the entire structure. We have the displacement for the entire structure. So from this data, if we wanted, we could back calculate stresses. We could back calculate strains. Think about it. We just did it all. The entire structure is solved from start to finish. Okay, that's the whole point of this whole method. Think about it. Start to finish, it's all done. One single method, we did it all. Okay, is everybody all right with that? I think that, that is really worth mentioning. This is a very powerful method. With a single one fell swoop, we did it all. Okay, now, 
When we do trusses, it's not as simple. We have to add a couple steps because with truss elements, the members are not just up, you know, left to right. The members are all over the place. So we have to do a little bit of trig, okay? When we're doing beams, okay, beams are a little more complicated because for beams, we have loads that are applied not just on the joints, but on the members. So how do you handle loads that are applied directly to the members? That's a little bit of a, a tricky situation. Frames is all that stuff together. But in the end, the process is the process. You take a structure, you divvy it up into individual elements. For each of those elements, you write a stiffness matrix. You take those stiffness matrices and you Avengers assemble them together to create a stiffness matrix for the whole system. You apply your boundary conditions. You solve for your displacements, use those displacements, back calculate your forces and reactions. And that's it. One fell swoop, you analyze the entire problem start to finish. Now in structural analysis, when you do indeterminate problems, you end up having to identify redundance and then you're only solving for one particular component of the problem. They, you know, the, the, the methods are highly specialized. In this, this method doesn't care whether or not the structure is determinate, indeterminate, it doesn't care. It just applies the same method across the board. Okay? It's why for complex structural analysis problems, stress analysis problems, it is the mainstay method. And it will continue to be for a very long time. Okay? Now, what we're going to do next time is we're going to take this problem and we are going to do it together, start to finish, okay, in Excel. So come next time, be prepared to open up Excel, and we're going to do this problem start to finish. And I'm going to show you a little tricks, a couple tricks with Excel that will make this problem a little easier, okay? Anybody have any questions? All right. I'm going to stop it there for tonight. You all have a, a, a good evening, rest of your weekend, and I will see you all on Tuesday.